All right, thanks. So uh, yeah, today will be like a very gentle and basic introduction to neural networks. Um, um, and I'll essentially leave out uh, uh, most of the unsupervised learning, leave that to Marina, and uh, leave out most of the um, invariances and equivariance stuff, and leave that to Patrick, and leave out all of the generative learning, and leave that to next Monday. Uh, and again, I expect this is probably 80% known to 80% of the people here, but 20% is probably a good amount of news for the learning rate at which we humans operate. Um, right, so first some resources. This is really uh, to start in case if you haven't done deep learning uh, yet. I think this is a good book to get an overview. It's pretty superficial, but it covers a lot of topics. Um, and it's, it's on the PDF is online. So, um, and this is um, an interesting resource for uh, like the interface of physics and machine learning. It's mostly not deep learning, uh, but it compares a lot of the machine learning concepts um, to physics or actually de like it derives or expresses some of the machine learning concepts in physics language, which is cool if you have a physics background. Um, <coughs> And yeah, I mean, you don't need to write this down now. All of the PDFs of the talks will be available. Um, and I can post this on the Slack. So um, OK, so, so famous examples of deep learning. I guess, I guess you all have seen this. So uh, AlphaGo was, uh, <coughs> I think, introduced in 2015 or 14. Um, and it. Uh, so actually, I was on an IPAM program in 2009 uh, when there was the, this, this uh, match between uh, Deep Blue, IBM Deep Blue, and, and Gary Kasparov. And Chess, was this 2009 or was this? Oh, and it was another IPAM program. I remember I was at IPAM somehow when this happened. Kasparov retired in 2005. So 2005, OK. Must have been no, 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 no. It was in the 2000s, pretty sure. We take credit for it anyways, but... IPAM. So it's somehow related to IPAM. I don't know how, but... <laughs> <clears throat> but so that, so that was uh, very cool at the time, and um, Go was supposed to be one of the games where this couldn't possibly be done because it was so hard, because the branching factor is so high, right? Every time in the, in, uh, in the game, you have so many options to make moves. Uh, like about 200 or so, that uh, um, the, 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 like the, the decision tree branches just very, very quickly. And uh, it's just not feasible with kind of classical uh, computational game playing methods that do some sort of tree search to go very deep. Uh, so the idea was you need a lot of intuition to know where you have to explore the tree. And this is um, <clears throat> exactly where, where AlphaGo uh, was actually good at by essentially using a smart policy uh, or a learned policy to uh, cut the tree uh, quite early and only explore a few possibilities uh, at every, at every uh, move. Um, AlphaGo, um, so the first one um, that uh, uh, that, that one over the, the Go Grandmaster was um, actually still trained with supervised learning. So essentially using a lot of um, expert knowledge that was coded. Um, AlphaGo Zero and then later Alpha Zero um, uh, didn't use any of, of this prior knowledge, but just essentially a definition of the rules of the game and then used uh, self-play. So the computer kind of plays it against itself. Um, using um, essentially virtual uh, games um, in order to improve. And so Alpha Zero is uh, kind of the, the sequel after Alpha Go Zero and kind of does that for uh, sort of any game or like a, a large set of games that could be uh, specified in terms of discrete rules like chess as well. Um, <clears throat> Self-driving cars. Um, typically use um, quite a bit of machine learning, but um, often less fancy uh, machine learning because you somehow have to be 
more on the robust and safe side, but there's definitely a lot of uh, image processing uh, going on for detecting obstacles, uh, road signs, where the road is, and all of this stuff. Um, WaveNet was an important development. Hmm. Should play audio now, but it doesn't. So I'll skip over that. <coughs> WaveNet is a is a, a speech, a text-to-speech machine, basically. So you input text, it generates speech, and the speech with these sounds extremely realistic. Maybe I can try to play it later without a, the video connector. And that was a very hard problem for a long time. So, so um, before the state of the art for text-to-speech was uh, yeah, recurrent neural nets, but uh, especially non-neural net solutions like hidden Markov models. And it's just sounded very artificial. Like you would have these pauses and these little moments in the speech where you noticed, okay, this is not a human. And the trick of WaveNet, one of the tricks of WaveNet is that it's trained on a, on a lot of human speech, but it kind of learns to pick up things that are not explicitly in the speech, like like swallowing or breathing, sounds that you don't really notice when you hear speech, but when they're missing, you notice it. And they're part of what makes the, the thing sound real. Um, but OK. Yeah, we can, we can try this one. Yeah. All right. Oop. That should do it. 1770 to 1850. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleisner. So, this is, this is all generated. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. And for some reason, they're doing extremely well in Chinese. I, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't say, but. Um, <clears throat> OK, um, so this is an example for recurrent neural network based uh, image to text generation. So you input the image and you generate a text, and then the network generates a text describing what is in the image. And uh, this is a pretty old example. So this is not uh, state of the art, but you can see here that you get really impressive successes like a person riding on a motorcycle on a dirt road. That's really cool that you get things like a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks for that. So you get catastrophic failures as well. And um, yeah, so um, let's go into some of the, the basic techniques. So first of all, we do uh, feed forward neural nets and supervised learning. So the idea of uh, artificial neural nets is, um, is of course related to biological neur uh, neurons um, but it's like a vast simplification in, uh, in the brain we have about 10,000 different types of neurons and then we have a lot of additional cells like the glial cells that are supporting the neurons and I mean even from a neurobiological point of view it's uh, there's relatively little understanding of what all of these different types of cells actually do in detail and there is a, a lot of missing knowledge of how like the, the, the kind of the molecular level, so how all of the basic switching and function is implemented translates to the cellular function. Of course, some of that is known, but it's, um, it's super complicated, basically. <clears throat> and you have like some neurons that have like a few neighbors, others have like uh, 100,000 neighbors, some are very tiny, some essentially uh, span like through half of the body. So you have a huge diversity of neurons. Um, um, in artificial neural networks, so the basic neurons work like this. Uh, so you have an input vector, you weight it, um, um, then you sum up. Uh, the weight, so basically you compute a scalar product between uh, the, weights, the, ve the weight vector and the input vector and then you feed it through nonlinearity and it's usually just an element-wise nonlinear function, something like a sigmoidal function, logistic function, whatever. So it's some f uh, function um, uh, that goes from uh, the real numbers to the real numbers and you just apply it to every um, input and um, you add perhaps a bias. You can write the bias um, as a weight that multiplies with a one input, a constant one input. Okay, so this is how you can <coughs> um, write this and then you have different options for activation functions. 
You can do pretty much anything here, but typical choices are just the identity, so doing nothing. That sometimes is useful at the output of a neural network if you want to essentially cover the range of real numbers and you don't have, you don't, at, at least a priori, don't have a particular range that you want to restrict your output to. Um, of course, using an identity only makes sense once in the neural network because if you just stack multiple um, identity uh, activation functions and otherwise you have a linear operation here, then you're just concatenating linear operations so you, one layer is sufficient to do that. Um, <coughs> um, okay, then common choices. Um, like a couple of years ago, or maybe 10 years ago, were logistic functions and hyperbolic tangent functions, so these sigmoidal functions. Those um, look very nice, they are smooth, they have uh, um, continuous derivatives, but um, unfortunately they have this property that they tend to um, have small gradients if you go into certain ranges of values here, uh, towards minus and plus large numbers, basically. Um, and so that causes problems with deep networks. Um, and you don't have to go very deep to, uh, to get problems with that. And, and the reason for that is uh, neural networks are usually trained using some form of gradient descent. So you need to compute gradients. If you have a concatenation of functions, that means you have to use the chain rule of differentiation. That means you will get, in order to compute the gradient, you will get a product of the gradients of the individual steps. And so if some of these guys are small, you get an annihilation of gradient uh, after so many layers with a high probability. So it's becoming very hard to train the network. Um, uh, for this reason, uh, people moved away from uh, these functions at some point. Um, they're, they're still used in certain contexts, but you have to take care of the gradient problem. Um, and started to use things like this. Very simple uh, rectified linear units, basically zero here. So when you're in this range uh, of values, the neuron is just dead and does nothing. Um, uh, but you want to be somewhere with the parameters close to the point where you can switch. Uh, and then here you switch to a linear function. <coughs> So um, mathematically, maybe not the nicest function. Uh, the uh, derivative is just a step function. But um, this works a lot better than these functions in terms of building deep networks. And then there are several variants of this uh, rectifiers that have nicer properties. For example, there's the softmax function. Uh, which is smooth and has a continuous derivative. Um, and uh, uh, there are. Uh, exponential linear units, etc., uh, etc. Et but so basically, most of the neural networks uh, that are being used use some sort of rectifier, so some piecewise defined function. Okay. <clears throat> so. Um, uh, kind of the first neural network was a single neuron, <laughs> um, the perceptron. So, okay, the perceptron, so um, developed in the 50s. Uh, basically, this is just a single neuron with a binary output, uh, which uh, outputs one if the inputs are uh, greater than zero and zero otherwise. So this is basically a function which can represent, this can learn a function uh, for, for a given parameter vector w that linearly separates the input space into zeros and ones. So it's a linear classifier. So you can represent certain functions. For example, if you look at um, logical functions, you can represent the AND function or the OR function. Uh, but for example, the XOR function is something you cannot sep um, represent because it's not linearly separable. So you cannot find a plane through the input space uh, that separates these ones from these zeros. Um, so hence the idea, maybe we can uh, do that with multiple layers of such neurons. <coughs> and that leads to multi-layer perceptrons. Um, and these are typically just called deep neuron, deep networks today, although this is not really deep in this example. So the idea is now, um, instead of having one neuron, we have many neurons and we stack them. And uh, we have hidden layers and an output layer. So um, 
There's a feed-forward neural network, so all the information flows in one direction, nothing goes back. Um, or I mean, gradient information goes back, but uh, the, for the forward uh, evaluation is just going one direction. And um, we call, uh, we essentially count all of the layers except for the input layer. So this would be a three layer uh, feed forward neural network. And uh, we speak of dense layers here. Dense because um, all the n neurons of the previous layer are connected to all of the neurons of the next layer. So the weights in every layer are organized as a densely connected matrix. A dense, dense matrix, where where all the elements may may be relevant. <coughs> okay, we don't count the input layer because the input is just a placeholder, really, for whatever is used as an input. Um, so uh, in this case, we have like three layers with corresponding weights. We may. Um, Okay, I'll speak about the other stuff later. And of course, a big issue is how do we choose the network architecture? Like how many layers, how wide, what activation functions, etc. And generally, this is a, a hyperparameter optimization problem. So usually we, so, so in principle, we can choose them by, by optimizing uh, the validation score um, and then later evaluate them by using the test score. But of course, practically, this is very expensive for neural networks because then you have to train the neural network for each point in the hyperparameter space. So a lot of intuition and, and gut feeling goes into what are the hyperparameters that I want to explore. So domain knowledge is very important for that. Like uh, you have to have some knowledge about the uh, application area in order to design um, well-performing neural networks. Okay, <coughs> a very important theoretical um, step was um, to show that neural networks of this type are universal function approximators in some sense. So this is a very sloppy formulation um, of the universal representation theorem. And there are actually many universal representation theorems for different classes of neural networks, different classes of activation functions, different classes of functions that you want to represent, etc. But the, the basic idea is that you have a continuous uh, a function on a compact set. You can uh, learn this function with a neural network to arbitrary accuracy. So that means on the set, you can achieve a prediction error that is smaller than an epsilon that you can choose. If you have a two-layer neural network and you just use enough hidden neurons. And you actually don't need the output nonlinearity for this proof. So essentially, you just need one nonlinear transformation um, and one set of weights and enough neurons in that hidden layer. All right. So um, that is theoretically nice, but it, maybe it's surprising, but, but, but then maybe it's not so surprising because you can do the same with linear regression, of course. If you just make, uh, um, if you just provide a basis set that is big enough, you can represent any continuous function on a compact set. And that's probably easier to imagine. And this, the idea is the same here. So in the proof, what you use is that you can um, select the weights uh, going into uh, one of these hidden neurons such that essentially it represents a step function. Then you can use another neuron to do the, in the reverse step. And then you can piece together your functions with little steps. That's not how the neural network will learn it in practice, but that's how the proof is constructed. Or some of these proofs are constructed. Okay, in practice, this statement is of limited use because there are a lot of problems uh, with achieving universal function approximation in practice. So first of all, just the fact that a, a set of parameters exists that can approximate a function that falls into the class um, um, of the theorem does not mean that we can find them. Uh, so the training problem is a completely different problem. Um, <coughs> The uh, question is also, um, is can we achieve in practice the error level that satisfies us in a given problem domain? And um, in, for many complex functions, the number of hidden neurons that we need to achieve good error is just enormous. Uh, so you can show that there are uh, certain problems um, 
certain types of functions where the number of hidden neurons that you would need grows exponentially in the size of the input. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, funct then the theorem is not that useful in practice. But uh, for, for some of these functions, you can show that while this is true for shallow neural networks, this is not true for deep neural networks. So if you exceed a certain depth, a certain number of layers, then you do not have this exponential growth anymore. And the idea behind that is sort of like a multi-scale idea. So if you have functions that have kind of multi-scale nature, where you have features that have like smaller features in them, uh, then um, like kind of learning them by heart and expressing them in one layer uh, can be very expensive. But if you can like do functions of functions of functions, you can represent them more efficiently. Okay, <clears throat> how do we train parameters? So um, basically um, um, all of the training algorithms that I use, most of the training algorithms that I used uh, uh, are doing a gradient descent. So first of all, we need a function that we can optimize. That's the loss function. So that's typically the starting point in formulating a machine learning problem, defining what, the, what is the loss function. If we have a score function, we just do minus the score as the loss and we minimize this function um, over uh, uh, a training set and in the parameters that we are training, which here are the weights on, on the, the neurons. So um, the simple gradient descent algorithm would be something like this. We start with a, um, a parameter set and we just go in steps, compute the gradient and update the parameters. And before going into more fancy um, <coughs> optimization algorithms, the question is how do we compute the gradient? And I've already mentioned the chain rule, so of course at some point we need to use the chain rule here, but we want to do that automatically, <coughs> right? We don't want to evaluate gradients, uh, write down what the gradient is uh, whenever we uh, code a new neural network. Um, uh, we want uh, an automatic machine that does that for us. And we just want to define the architecture of the neural network and the rest is just happening. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and the main idea here is this so-called backpropagation algorithm, which essentially automatizes or automates the uh, computation of the gradients for neural network-like structures. And on one slide, it works like this. So um, what we need is the, um, so this is the, just a basic formulation of a dense neural network. So uh, the output um, of a layer L neuron I is the activation function applied to a vector that we call Z. And the Z vector is just this linear operation that this layer does. So that's just an abbreviation. What we're interested in is the, um, the loss function that we want to evaluate and the gradient of the loss function. Usually the loss function is some sum of terms over individual data points. So the gradient is also a sum of terms over individual data points. So uh, it is sufficient if we get expressions for one of these terms. Um, then we define this error vector. This is basically a sensitivity vector and it expresses at every layer, um, so the last, uh, the last uh, um, error vector just expresses how the um, loss function at a certain data point uh, depends on changes of the C vector. So the, uh, the results of the linear operation of this last layer before we go into the nonlinearity. And then it expresses that in terms of um, the derivative of the loss function. So the loss function itself is something we need to be able to derive, but that's something we can essentially just code for the uh, number of loss functions that, that we may use, like least, squ uh, least square errors, very simple of course. Um, and then it uses the derivative of the nonlinear function. And again, this is something we can just code for all the nonlinear functions that are possible building blocks in our neural network. So this is something that we can prepare in the code. Um, then the key step. I just want to, you, you went over something quickly, I think is really important. That sure. the loss function has to be differentiable. Yeah, the loss function has to be at least piecewise differentiable. Yeah. Right, so if you had, you know, there are cases where we have very complicated loss right. functions. Mm -hmm. Like 
play the rest of the Go game, mm -hmm. right? That's your loss function. Exactly. It's not updated mm -hmm. and reachable, and then, then the more stuff shows up. But that's it's a, it easy just to, to, to flip over that, but that there's a bunch of stuff that happens on top Absolutely. of this that when you can't get that. So. Yeah. So, for example, when there any like when there's any randomness um, in in uh, in in uh, your your game, then uh, you, you may have problems there, and then there are tricks like reinforce that I will not talk about. Um, but there are tricks like um, reparameterization trick for generative uh, neural networks that I will talk about on Monday. Uh, but so for now, I'm just assuming these are functions, and at least piecewise, we can write down the, the, the derivatives. <coughs> the key step in the backpropagation um, algorithm is this one. Uh, so basically, this says, if I know the error vector, so the sensitivity vector at a layer L minus 1, uh, uh, sorry, L plus 1, so at a, a later layer, um, how do I write down the sensitivity vector in the previous layer? So how do I backpropagate these sensitivity vectors? And uh, it takes this expression. Again, we need the derivative of the activation function and the weights. Relative. So this is the backpropagation step. And um, so then the last, so these are the main variables I need to store in order uh, to do backpropagation. And then from there, I can compute the uh, gradients with respect, so the derivatives with respect to the weight, so the parameters that I want to change. And then the last step is to update these parameters uh, by doing a gradient descent step. So I just move them against the gradient. Okay, so all I need to do now is to uh, code the derivatives for every type of nonlinearity that I provide in a code and uh, derivatives for the loss functions that I provide in the code, and then I can assemble my derivatives automatically for any neural network based on these building blocks. All right, so the real power of um, essentially all of these uh, mm, deep learning softwares, uh, software packages like TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc., comes from the fact that um, so you have operations, like uh, algebraic operations, that you can essentially combine in any way, but that you could do in NumPy and MATLAB, etc., as well. But now they come together with definitions of the derivatives of these operations, at least for most of these functions. And under the hood, uh, when you write down the expressions that you want to evaluate, there is a graph, a computational graph being built that says, um, that defines how your operations are connected to each other. So it defines a flow of information, essentially a flow of, in general, tensor objects, uh, multidimensional arrays from the inputs to the outputs, and it defines how you can evaluate um, a step in the graph and also how you can compute derivatives uh, of the outputs with respect to the inputs of every graph. And then together with the backpropagation algorithm, you can essentially do the backward evaluation of the gradients. And so this gives you a very rich and powerful computational framework by which you can essentially just assemble any mathematical operation that has piecewise differentiable functions and some sort of parameters. So the notion of what is a neural network these days is a lot more general than, than what it was like 20 years ago. It's, uh, you can essentially, what's being called a neural network now is pretty much anything you can assemble with TensorFlow. And, and that, that doesn't have any other name for it, right? Uh, so, so these things have no resemblance to n actual neural networks anymore. But uh, so now, basically, this has become just general evaluation of computational graphs and changing parameters of operations, um, of, of mathematical operations, by some sort of learning rule. And, and because of that, uh, machine learning uh, or deep learning is basically applicable to pretty much anything because um, anything that can be modeled in some sort of quantitative way and has parameters is amenable to machine learning. <coughs> okay, so actually nobody uses real gradient descent to train these networks. What's a very important step is to go from gradient descent to stochastic gradient descent. So the idea is as follows. Uh, many uh, cost or loss functions have uh, this form. So uh, a sum over individual t 
terms for each data point. Um, and then the gradient also has this form and you can view this as an expectation value. So this is an expectation value of some property uh, that we are computing and we are evaluating it on a training set here which is a, you can think of it as a limited sample of uh, whatever has generated the training set. So we think there is an underlying probability distribution that spits out data and we have a finite sample of that. So we are computing an expectation value even if you evaluate the whole, the whole data set. So we can also um, go one step further and say then I can just subsample this data set. So I can take a smaller sample and compute a, a approximate the expectation value based on this smaller se uh, set. And this smaller set is called a mini batch. Um, and uh, so what we can do is we can approximate the gradient of the full data set using a mini batch. Um, and essentially this just means if you do this many times, we'll just um, um, approach the full gradient estimate of the full data set. So why is this useful? Okay, so first of all, that's the idea. So the, the main difference to normal gradient descent where we would do a gradient evaluation on the full training set and then make a step in that direction is that now we evaluate the gradient for every mini batch and after that make a little step, st uh, change the parameters in that direction. So essentially we do noisy parameter updates. So why is that useful? Uh, it's useful, so obviously every single parameter update is a lot cheaper now because a mini batch is smaller than the full data set. But it would seem that this is not, this is, this is kind of cheating this argument because uh, of course you need to accumulate many mini batches in order to have seen all of your data. But in practice, um, first of all, uh, the stochasticity can help because it doesn't yeah. tend to get stuck in shallow minima anymore. Um, so it's an essentially adding a little bit noise to your search direction, so that can actually help. And in practice, uh, for loss functions that have this type, and this is not exclusive to neural networks, uh, stochastic gradient descent tends to converge a lot faster than just the accumulated effort of the mini batch evaluations. So with straightforward gradient descent would be probably almost impossible to train any state-of-the-art neural network. Um, <clears throat> you need other aspects to, to get robust convergence in neural networks than this, but this is an important component. Um, one thing you can do, um, uh, you can do STD on multiple cores and things. Yes, yeah, it's parallelizable very well, yeah. Exactly. So um, <clears throat> again, uh, pure stochastic gradient descent is rarely used. Um, uh, in practice, one uses like some derived methods. Uh, for example, stochastic gradient descent with momentum is an important step. So you compute, um, uh, basically you have some sort of drag coefficient here. Uh, so, so essentially you have some sort of memory of the last direction that you took. So uh, that there is essentially reduced stochastic fluctuation and uh, gradient updates are more consistent with each other if you do that subsequently. And interesting for physicists is that you can um, write down the, um, you can rewrite this function as uh, um, kind of um, an equation of motion of a particle in a viscous fluid. So if you have a particle in a viscous fluid with a drag uh, coefficient, um, then you can write down the total force on the particle, so that, that is uh, mass times acceleration in terms of the, uh, the uh, deterministic force, the force of some potential on the particle, um, and a drag force. And you can essentially just translate this algorithm into this form. Uh, you can show that this is kind of um, discrete time approximation, something like an Euler approximation of this differential equation. And then you get an equivalence between these parameters here, the drag coefficient and the mass, and the parameters here. So this gamma parameter, and this memory parameter, 
and the, um, uh, the step size here, eta. And if you um, actually use stochastic um, gradient, if you additionally take the fact into account that you're using stochastic gradient descent, so you have a noisy um, estimate of your gradient here, uh, then you can express this via a noise, additional noise force that you get here, and then you have the Langevin equation. So stochastic gradient descent with momentum is a Langevin dynamics in parameter space, which also means that you don't actually minimize, but you essentially th you do a, like a simulation of your system, and you go to um, a situation of um, 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 a low energy, but you still have fluctuations that are remaining. <coughs> the temperature is basically a learning rate divided by batch size, or the square root of that, or something like this. So if you vary the learning rate, you're knowing that. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, and that would then be an adaptive method, like Adam. So, so that's uh, actually what um, what's being used. So there's adaptive learning rate, and there are typically also ways uh, to update the the, um, the gradient in ways that remember what we've done last. So these are, um, in some sense, second order methods that get information about the Hessian without explicitly computing the Hessian or. or um, non-trivial approximations to it. And this leads to methods such as ADAM or um, uh, RMS prop, et cetera. And these are uh, state-of-the-art optimizers that are uh, typically used in practice. OK. <coughs> uh, yes? So are there no efforts at all to, do, to use gradient-free optimizers? Uh, yes, there are. There are for reinforcement learning, for example. So Um, yeah, so, so, so there are some functions where that involve, for example, terms that you cannot uh, derive, and then there are some reparameterization tricks uh, that you can rewrite this function such that you don't need uh, these derivatives. So there is work in this direction, and especially for, for reinforcement learning. Yeah. where you don't naturally get the gradients of the thing you actually want to estimate. And so then you end up with these things where you're going essentially Monte Carlo methods to, esti you know, to estimate. But yes. there, you, you know, dimensionality kills you really quickly. So yeah. that's, that's the other place I've seen a bunch of research. That's one way to do that. And then I would say in general, often the, the trick is to try to reparameterize your problem in such a way that you get something that is differentiable, even if you have at some point like discrete variables. There was another question or a comment? Yeah. Like complex and natural ones. Yeah. 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 I guess I'm understanding the connections in the gradients in the complex button. Mm. Okay, I'll show some of the reparameterization tricks on Monday, but I don't have it in this talk. Okay, how can we think of what does a neural network learn? So this is again just a simple multi-layer perceptron. Um, this is. Uh, a very coarse version of MNIST, uh, so these handwritten digits, uh, and we're trying to recognize which number is in the image. And basically the idea is that the hidden layer um, has certain weights, uh, so that means um, it uh, will be activated, um, or it will have a strong output activation, given a certain input pattern. So essentially, if, this, if there is a large value of the scalar product between the weight vector and the input vector, then we have an activation. So uh, perhaps this neuron is parameterized such that it likes the first uh, few pixels here, which correspond to the first row in this image. So 
it would be activated if we see a horizontal bar here. And then this might be uh, uh, trained on seeing uh, like a highlighted region in the top left, for example. But this is, of course, extremely specific to seeing certain features in certain places. <coughs> so you can do things like vertical lines in certain places, or horizontal lines, or small circles, or whatever. Uh, but then, <coughs> in order to generalize this notion a bit, one thing you can do is to make the network deeper. Um, and then you can aggregate features. So you can maybe have, you have specialized feature detectors for horizontal lines in particular rows of the image. Uh, but then you have a, a deeper neuron that uh, aggregates this information and say, is there any vertical line or is there any ver vertical line in this area of the image? So uh, even without doing like additional tricks like convolutions, etc., you can do cer a certain amount of generalization in just feed-forward multilayer perceptrons. Um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, until until a um, couple of years ago, maybe ten years ago, uh, the, it was difficult to train deep networks efficiently, and and. Um, much of the momentum of the, the, the current interest in deep learning is because people found ways of doing this um, and, and started to be able to train deep networks, that means above a certain number of layers, and that was key in order to uh, get um, like superhuman performance in certain benchmarks, for example. Um, and often uh, um, this, this progress, or much of this progress is credited to these three gentlemen, uh, Jan is in the IPAM board, um, and, and uh, these are some of the uh, old papers that use certain tricks to um, uh, essentially be able to do deeper training. I won't go into them in detail because um, in practice one uses quite different strategies nowadays, um, but so Joshua Benjo, uh, Jeff Hinton, and Jan de Kuhn won the Turing Award this year, essentially recognizes, recognizing this, uh, this work. Um, <clears throat> important um, steps to make deep networks trainable are, first of all, using activation functions that don't forget about your gradient. Or using, if you do, you have to use essentially other and other net network architecture that somehow preserves your gradient and carries it deep. I will talk about that later. Stochastic gradient descent is extremely important, uh, as opposed to using deterministic gradient descent. And then, of course, just being fast is important. So having GPUs and having them usable in such a form that you can just throw your neural network on them without having to worry about writing GPU code. Uh, every time you do that, uh, that's, that's a huge um, advantage too. <coughs> and having these neural network packages uh, like TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc., that, that does this for you in an easy way. Okay, I think I will first skip over this for now. Um, can come back to it if there is time. And uh, now talk about convolutional neural networks. So confnets are uh, an extremely important step compared to non-convolutional neural networks, <coughs> uh, especially in uh, image recognition, but essentially in for, for any type of input that has some sort of topology, some sort of underlying geometric structure that relates the individual dimensions of your of your signal to each other. So in, in an image, every pixel is a neighbor of, the, of, of uh, eight other pixels, um, or four other pixels, depending on how you define neighborhood. Um, and the same is true in uh, like texts, in, in, in audio signals, in videos, etc., etc. So many signals that we are dealing with, and the same is true for um, most of the physics data that, that we're dealing with has some intrinsic geometry. So there is a, a sense of proximity and distance. And it's useful to take this into account when doing your calculations. Um, and um, <coughs> convolutions are ex essential to essentially get anywhere with image uh, processing. Anything that involves images, uh, I don't think you can uh, 
uh, get state-of-the-art performance without using any sense of convolution. And what a convolution does, um, so a discrete convolution is basically just defined as the sum over uh, two functions that are shifted with respect to one another. And in, um, in an image, what we're doing, um, so this is a grayscale image, uh, which has one color channel. Uh, um, we have certain activations here that correspond to brightness. And uh, we have a filter, a convolutional kernel or filter, which has parameters in here. So those are the parameters that are, we are training. And then convolving these two signals means we shift this signal over uh, the image. And then for every positioning of the filter with respect to the image, um, we evaluate the scalar product here and we just write the output into the next, um, not layer, but like this is the convolved image. And then, so this is the linear operation of a convolutional layer, and then after that we would apply a nonlinear operation like a rectified linear unit or something else, and that would be one layer in a convolutional network. So, um, and the, there are two key properties here. One is that um, a certain signal will lead to the same convolved signal no matter where it is in the image. So that's uh, um, a certain sort of translational invariance, to be precise, translational equivariance. And um, <coughs> secondly, we're using the same parameters of the filter, no matter where we are in the image. So we do parameter sharing. Yeah, this is extremely important. Uh, so getting some sort of parameter sharing for cases where there is some sort of similarity structure, uh, some sort of invariance or equivariance in your data is essential in order to get good performance. Um, okay, so equivariance just means, uh, uh, like Cecilia showed, if you have the cat and you have the cat filter, uh, uh, then you get a certain activation of where, where, where the head of the cat is, and if you just move the cat, it shows up elsewhere. So, um, uh, mathematically, that means if you have a certain group action, like translation in this case, um, and you have your convolution operation, then these two um, uh, operations commute. So you can translate and convolve, or convolve and translate. <coughs> that is equivariance. So, um, so traditional confidence are translationally equ equivariant. In physics, often we are interested in other in, in equivariances, such as rotational in equivariance, for example or maybe permutational invariance, uh, equivariance. And so these are a little bit more tricky to achieve. And um, I think Patrick will talk about that, right? Yeah. To some degree. <laughs> so. All right, so it will be a surprise. Um, OK, in images, it's um, <coughs> um, can be straightforward uh, or intuitive to make sense of what the filters learn. The filters are, of course, some, something that just process the image and that find certain features in the image. So you can actually visualize them and in some cases um, at least think you're making sense of them. Um, of course, it's uh, a lot harder in practice. Uh, and so, for example, what you I mean, of course, the in, uh, idea of using convolutions in image processing is quite old. That's not a neural network thing. Uh, so, so convolutions have been used in programs like Photoshop uh, uh, way before uh, uh, people used deep learning. Um, so, um, but the difference is, of course, now that you that you are training these convolutional filters, so that uh, the entries of the filters are parameters that you're learning with backpropagation uh, within some learning task of in a within a neural network. 
Um, but you can write down filters that correspond to uh, detecting edges or to blurring the image or to sharpen the image, etc. Okay, <clears throat> if you have a given training task, let's say uh, image data set with um, um, faces and let's say you have a certain classification task uh, that consists of let's say classifying uh, the images into uh, images of people or non-people or uh, male and female or people with glasses or without glasses, beards, without beards, whatever, um, and you use confnets, then typically what you get is that the filters in the first uh, layer do things like edge detection and maybe other things, but edge detection filters are almost exclusively in there. Um, because it's just a very useful um, filter to do anything with an image, to detect where the edges are, then you can detect where objects are, and then you can do something with that. And then higher level images often, uh, filters often correspond to elements that you find in a lot of images that are useful to make a decision, like in this case noses and ears and eyes. And then maybe there are things like weird faces in deeper layers. Uh, but of course, this is not like actual faces that you have in the data, but essentially like a basis set of faces that are useful to somehow uh, express uh, this, this or uh, to, to um, say something about the space of face images that you have as an input. How do you extract these representations? Uh, these are actually just the values of the filters being plotted into the, so it's just a, the, an image. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, so. So this represents your training data. So completeness in what sense? In the sense that you can, you're maybe missing you're something. Missing, I don't know, beardy faces. You catastrophic. Yeah. So if you don't have them in your in your training set, that you, that's probably the case. Yeah. But it's very difficult to say something about completeness in non-linear um, algorithms, right? You can say something about like a vector space that I'm covering with my solution if you have a linear machine, like a kernel machine, for example. But as soon as you uh, actually add one layer and the, the actual machine becomes non-linear, this becomes very tricky because then uh, you have to talk about manifolds. You don't know when your space is complete, basically. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so the convolutional neural networks were essential to get uh, uh, good benchmark performance in many tasks, such as MNIST. This is, this is an old value. You can get better uh, than 0.95% test error. But you already see in this, uh, this is, I think, Lenet. That the misclassified examples are essentially so crappy that it probably doesn't make sense to get better than 0.95% test error because it's very difficult to decide what that should even be in most cases. And um, okay, so important remark is convolution is a linear operation, uh, so you can just rewrite the convolution operation into a matrix vector uh, form where the weight matrix now just shares the parameter in all of the rows. Uh, if you think of a, a convolution in a 1D signal, then uh, your um, filter is just a vector that is in general smaller than the uh, image, the, the, the vector that you're convolving with. And then the weights are just like whatever weights you apply on the small vector. And uh, these weights will now show up in this weight matrix, just shift it. Uh, because you apply the same filter uh, to every position in your vector. And so the same works for images, of course, just that uh, these numbers are now not, not next to each other, but they are spaced in a certain way. That depends on how you transformed uh, the 2D image to a vector. Um, and the same is true for any, any higher dimensional array. What do you 
So at the edges, so what here I'm assuming is that you have what's called valid padding, so you don't go over the edge. So that means your convolved signal is smaller than your original image, and uh, it, how much smaller depends on how big your filter is. Um, but what's often used is so-called zero padding. So you take your image and you just add zeros outside, and then you can go over the image. Um, and you do that in such a way that the convolved image has the same size as the unpadded original image. So that's, that's used especially if you want to do deep networks, because otherwise you would lose dimension every time you do convolution. <coughs> OK. <coughs> Convolutional neural networks usually do not only consist of convolutions, but also um, of uh, some sort of step that um, reduces the dimension of the image at some point, but in a deliberate fashion, not just because of um, a valid padding uh, with convolutions. And often one uses pooling, uh, some sort of pooling. So basically, you just uh, kind of take the maximum or the average or some sort of some other operations over a block of pixels. Very frequently max pooling is used, uh, where you essentially just take the maximum over a two by two neighborhood, for example, of images. And um, there are other strategies like dilated convolutions, where you don't use every pixel, but every second pixel in your convolution, etc. But the um, uh, important aspect of that is basically this introduces some sort of multiscalarity in your uh, processing machinery. So you have some operation like convolution that can detect features. And then at some point, you are reducing um, or you kind of coarse grain your signal. Uh, to a lower dimensional signal. And so uh, when you detect uh, higher order features, you're also enhancing your field of vision. So you're increasing essentially the size of the image that you're looking at, such that if you do this multiple times, eventually you will be able to see the entire input of the image in order to be able to det detect global features. Right? Because otherwise, if you wouldn't do that, you are, your field of vision, so how much bigger is this amount of input that you see if you go deeper, would grow very, very slowly. Right? If you have a 3 by 3 filter, for example, in an image, uh, uh, that is often what's being used, then every convolutional layer just adds like one additional uh, row and column um, around your kernel that you see in every layer. So in order to uh, um, see global features of an uh, uh, image that is 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, you would, you would need um, hundreds of layers. <coughs> Whereas you get there much more quickly if you do something like this, because that does like factor two uh, in your field of vision for every pooling layer. OK, so convolutional layers have a motivation in, in, in neuroscience. Uh, so in the uh, early 60s, late 50s, there was seminal work by these two people, Hubel and Wiesel. And they um, studied the visual cortex V1. So that's uh, essentially the, like the first few layers of the visual cortex in cats. Um, and they try to understand what activation patterns you get when you show certain images or patterns, um, uh, patterns of dark and bright uh, to cats. And they found that uh, neurons in the early vision system respond mostly to specific patterns of light, such as oriented bars, so that there are certain kind of edge detection filters in, in V1. Um, <coughs> And also, V1 is arranged as a 2D spatial map, also in us humans. Uh, so you can actually uh, see this very nicely if you do uh, brain imaging and you show uh, an image to a person. You see essentially kind of um, a mirror image of this image in the activity pattern of the brain. So it's really like actually in there as an image. It looks really weird. Um, uh, so, um, okay, so, uh, so these V1 units are uh, organized as a spatial map, map, like a conf net, 
and uh, uh, they also respond approximately linear uh, to a locally receptive fields. Um, so that may, it makes sense to think about uh, confnet detector units. Um, and actually most of the simple cells perf seem to perform something like convolutions uh, that are uh, uh, described by these so-called Gerber functions. And Gerber functions are, the, it is, um, it's essentially it's a mathematical function series that can generate these uh, edge detection filters. Yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, is the deep learning uh, Gabon function exhibiting a similar structure as the Eiffel count, which is observed as you know, the cerebral cortex, the V1? Are you familiar with the Eiffel count? No. Ah. This, I think, is missing in deep learning. And it's a structure mm -hmm. that is inside the human brain, so I was wondering. OK, maybe we can talk about that more. Okay, unsupervised learning, I won't uh, go into detail. Just a, a comment. So basically, what I've shown so far is essentially mostly supervised learning. Mm. But of course, also for unsupervised learning tasks, we can often write down a loss function. And many of the algorithms, like shallow algorithms, that just do some sort of unsupervised learning, like PCA, clustering, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are often formulated as algorithms, but you can write down equivalently a loss function uh, that is optimized by this algorithm. And so if you think about an unsupervised learning problem and you're inspired by certain algorithms that do something like you want to achieve, then this is the, the, the way to go. Think of what is the loss function that this algorithm would be optimizing and then code that, for example, in a neural network. Uh, so, uh, principal component analysis uh, does, does uh, linear dimension reduction, and basically the oh, I haven't even. So, uh, basically, you can show that it is um, minimizing the difference between uh, the signal and the signal, and then you apply the uh, the um, a projection matrix and the transpose projection matrix. So, you kind of you project and you lift. Um, and then uh, you minimize the difference between these two signals. And um, then one way to encode this as a neural network would be, for example, an autoencoder, where you uh, go through a high dimensional input, um, you uh, go down to a low dimensional latent space or code, and you go to a higher dimensional space again, and you compare, um, you minimize the reconstruction error. And that alone has a lot of problems. This can learn uh, like just images by heart and uh, not be able to generalize very well. And then an important uh, step to, to generalize is the, what's called the variational autoencoder. And we'll see that next week. <clears throat> OK. So last uh, topic that I wanted to cover is recurrent neural networks. Um, so uh, all of the structures that I've shown so far is fixed input size, fixed output size. But what we often have in practice is uh, a data with a variable amount of, uh, with a variable size in some sense. For example, a text. Let's say we want to read a text and we want to extract information from the text. And we want to be um, in, uh, or we want to translate the text from one language into another. So of course, we need to be prepared for many different lengths of, of text. Um, and for this, a good structure uh, to think about is a recurrent structure, recurrent neural nets. There are different types of um, uh, recurrent problems. Uh, so uh, for example, we have one input, but we want to have like a variable amount of outputs. Uh, like in the image to text problem that I showed you in the beginning, where we want to generate descriptive text for a fixed size image. Um, many to one. We like, like there are these, these uh, quite famous um, 
Trump tweet uh, emotion classifiers uh, that you can use uh, as a help for stock market prediction, for example. So that would be like variable text size, and then you have one class at the output. Um, or a number at the output or something like this, Th then this would be like text-to-text -text translation. And this would be like online many-to-many. Um, -many. So if you don't want to delay, if you don't want to accept a de delay for some reason. <coughs> OK, uh, so recurrent neural networks are specialized for processing sequences of values that may have variable length. Uh, example, I have a text. Um, I want to um, get some information from that text, but uh, this information can come in different places. Um, like, for example, what is the year I went to Chile? Mm -hmm. I can have many different texts that have this information placed in different places. Um, and so the key idea here is, again, parameter sharing. So we code uh, some sort of processing into a parametric operation. And we apply the same sort of operation to different positions of the sequence. So that's the key idea. And uh, so this relates very nicely to the dynamical systems uh, talk we will have next by Steve. And uh, uh, so basically, you can think of the uh, recurrent neural network as a discrete dynamical system. Uh, so, for example, we can uh, define this dynamical system, which says uh, there is a vector h of t, t maybe a time or some other sequence position in your sequence. And um, this just is defined by a function, which depends on some parameters that we are training. <coughs> and it depends, so the inputs of these functions are the um, vector at the last time step, or the last position in the sequence, and some other input that has a fixed size. <coughs> um, and now we train this network basically to just predict the future from the past, maybe to, to predict how a signal evolves in time. And this vector h, uh, h for hidden, um, hidden information or hidden layer uh, or hidden units is, is so, so to say, is a summary of the present and the past. So it's a sort of memory, if you like. It kind of um, combines the signals that we have seen before and uses that in order to make the next step of the prediction. Um, so we can write down, uh, um, like, graphically represent this function in this way. So there is an input x uh, that goes into um, a function which combines x and h in order to generate the new h. And this dot here, uh, this bullet, represents a time delay of one. So essentially, this just halts the signal for one step before moving it on. So that's this, uh, what causes this t minus 1 here. Um, or we can take this representation and unroll it in time. So then we will write it in this way. So we have x t minus 1 going into the function together with the last, or with an initial value here to give us h t minus 1, etc. <coughs> So we have these two different representations. Of course, we somehow pro program something like this, but we will use then in, some, in, in training this function something like this. And um, so the important um, idea here is that uh, this representation is really the architecture of the neural network. It really shows you every parameter that occurs only once. But by unrolling the network in this form, you can turn this recurrent neural network into a feedforward neural network, at least if you limit yourself to finite sequences. And usually you have finite sequences in the training data. And then you can just train the network with normal uh, stochastic gradient descent and back propagation. Yeah? So it's just, uh, you just unroll the graph during training. Um, 
Of course, that means that the network can become quite deep during training time if you need to just uh, consider deep sequences or long sequences. And it can become expensive to do that. There is also a trick that sometimes works where you can avoid the, the deep unrolling. That's called teacher forcing. Those are cases uh, like, for example, if you have Markovian systems where like for every processing step of the neural network you have like the next step uh, that you have in your training data as a reference, then you can essentially cut all of these connections in time and just do this uh, stepwise uh, training. But those are special cases. So in general you, you, you will not have that. Um, there is an interesting relationship between uh, recurrent neural networks of certain types and feed-forward um, multilayer perceptrons. So a, a recurrent neural network of this form here, where you have these inputs, these are outputs, this is uh, the training signal that you want to match, and uh, this is some sort of loss function that compares the two. Uh, this is a these are hidden units which encode the hidden state. And then you have um, essentially neural network functions here with parameters u, w, v. And each of these is just one neural network layer. So you have linear operations with matrices w, u, and v. And then you have a nonlinear operation like a logistic uh, function that you apply after this linear operation. So this is a relatively shallow, in this, in this dimension, shallow recurrent neural network. So you can show that whereas um, while a two-layer perceptron with enough hidden units can represent any smooth function on a compact set, the um, recurrent neural network with this structure can represent any algorithm that translates um, any input sequence to an um, output sequence. So it is sort of universal in a, in a Turing sense. Okay, as I mentioned, recurrent neural networks can uh, force you to go quite deep during the training if you have to train for long sequences. So if you want to um, uh, let's say, complete a text uh, with a meaningful word that is missing, and you have a short sentence, uh, you don't need to go very deep. Let's say you do like this word by word or character by character. Uh, then after, if you do character by character, after like 20 layers, you are here. That's already quite deep, but, but maybe that's still doable. But if you want to complete this sentence where the important information to insert French here is here in the beginning, uh, then you have to carry your gradient information very, very deep. Uh, so if you unroll the graph, you will have many layers. And then recurrent neural networks is quite an old concept. So this is essentially from a time where, where people used like hyperbolic tangents and logistic functions as activation functions. And then this would break if you would just do like uh, a straightforward deep neural network with these activation functions because you would lose the gradient information. Okay, so a very important step in the development of these recurrent neural networks was lo long short time memories uh, by, by uh, Sepp Hochreiter and Jürgen Schmidhuber. And um, so uh, whereas in a simple recurrent neural network as I sketched it just before, you would just always go through a nonlinearity every time you go one step in the sequence. You don't do this here. And this is a very complicated um, structure. So I will not go into details of this structure. Uh, uh, so these are different gates that are called like forget gates and then update gates, etc. Um, and basically the idea is though that we have nonlinearities here. So these are nonlinear functions that have this problem of uh, an gradient annihilation if you would stack them deep. But um, there is one channel, uh, the so-called cell state, that we feed through the LSTM cell uh, 
Um, and uh, this uh, signal is the signal that is actually carried on deep in the sequence. And we only do linear operations to this signal, like multiplication or addition, as a function of these nonlinear outputs. And because of that, you can carry gradient information very deep through this signal without losing it. But you can still do very nonlinear operations because what you do, the linear operations you do with this vector are results of nonlinear operations. And this um, structure, uh, so, so this, this is uh, uh, something that allowed you to go to deep sequences and to start doing things like like text-to-text -text translation in a meaningful way. Um, and this is very, very similar uh, to what's now known as a ResNet, a residual neural network. <clears throat> okay, uh, recurrent neural networks are fun. You can do, do uh, cool things with it, like generate uh, text, for example. So this is a, the result from a, a neural network, a recurrent neural network, LSTMs, uh, that um, you train on a corpus of Shakespeare text and then you have just started with a word and invent new Shakespeare texts and uh, certainly what you get, I mean it gets the formatting right or kind of this looks like Shakespeare and if you read it, why Salisbury must find this flesh and thought that which I am not absent, not a man in fire. Suddenly it sounds like Shakespeare. It may not make a lot of sense, but uh, uh, it's definitely fun. You can also uh, do things like just have it generate LaTeX code, like actually LaTeX source code, trained on a corpus of math texts and it will write math uh, and kind of uh, invent lemma and think it has proven something. <laughs> and uh, actually... It's, uh, it's strange, it really looks like that. Yes, and uh, um, so actually this is like almost compiled, so this is probably as good as a human in getting LaTeX text that will <laughs> compile. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah. So let's see, maybe there are some interesting theorems in there. Uh, right, so, okay, I'm essentially done to some commonly used tricks at the end. So um, there, there are of course many, many tricks and they're very domain specific, uh, but uh, one, of, uh, um, one important trick that often uh, is seen is something called multitask learning. So uh, the idea here is that you you want to do different things um, uh, with your with your neural network or your machine learning um, uh, model, um, and you're sharing parameters um, between them because they all rely on one input. That can help to generalize and to be more robust. And one example of that is AlphaGo Zero. So AlphaGo Zero uses two networks um, in order that are called policy and value network. So the policy network basically tells you what is the, um, with what probability will I take a certain action? So will I make a certain move on the board next given the current state of the board and actually also the states of the last couple of steps? Uh, whereas the value network will uh, give me an estimate of how good my position is at the moment uh, or how good the position is for any uh, state of the game. And these two things are then used in this um, algorithm that is called Monte Carlo Tree Search which expands um, the, the game state uh, uh, to a certain depth and chooses to expand certain leaves with a probability um, that depends on the policy network and can and you then use the value network in order to rate these states and then at some point you have to stop and then you have to choose to go along a certain path and then repeat. Um, and since both of these networks use the same input information, so the current and the past few game states, uh, they can share a lot of the parameters. So what AlphaGo Zero does is to have like a very, very deep network um, 
I think it's 80 layers or 40 layers, 40. Um, and then just has a value hat and a policy hat. Where is it? Policy hat and value hat. So these are just like put on top of this deep network. So most of the processing is done jointly between these networks that do different tasks. And that's, um, of course, an idea that can be very valuable for physics problems as well, where you have like one structure, but you want to, uh, as an input, or one data set as an input, but you want to predict multiple properties. <coughs> One aspect that's important to know is um, um, adversarial attacks and training. So first of all, networks are quite, can be, because they're very nonlinear, they can represent very nonlinear functions, they can be also quite sensitive. So uh, in, for example, image classification, uh, if you've trained your network to do really well on a certain data set, and now let's say you just add a little bit of noise like just Gaussian noise uh, to your image, then often your uh, prediction uh, accuracy will just uh, go down a lot, like will, will fail catastrophically in many cases. So you can have something like this image, a panda, and uh, let's say this was trained on uh, animal images and the performance was extremely well on that data set. And now you just add a tiny amount of noise that gives you this image, so you can't even see as a human that there is noise in the image. And suddenly uh, the network says this is a given. And I was totally confident about yeah, it. That's going to happen. Not, you can't really do it with random noise. You do have to go in very particular directions to break it. Well, that's an adversarial attack. Right, right. It's, not in ran it's not in a lot of random directions it breaks, but you can find directions very easily that very much break the network. So there exist directions which are terrible. It's not that most directions are terrible. No, that depends. I, I wouldn't yeah, I, think, I think there are the things that say that around that direction, most are also terrible. Yes, yeah, so there's not spirit, you know, it is, but if you pick a random direction, you're not likely to get this, this terrible. It depends. It depends on the data set. So, if it, so if, for example, if you do so. Gaussian noise is not, I mean, that's not catastrophically fail what you said. So normally, I mean, filters of deep net have the ability that they gain noise. I mean, so kind of a preferred example, this is, I mean, specially crafted uh, noise. So this, this is what I wanted to say next. So this is called adversarial um, attacks, if you... If you yeah, deep nets are pretty robust to normally fight noise. I mean, that depends on the data set. For example, if you do Cypher 10, ResNet 20, which is achieving like 95% uh, prediction accuracy, close to the state of the art, uh, you add a little bit of noise, totally bankruptcy. No. We can, we, I, we did try. I still didn't understand. It's also been like a single pixel attack, as far as I recall. Yes. But again, it's not the case that you pick a random pixel to change it. You no, no, not one it. random pixel. It's more that they're, 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 now, it's still crazy, by the way, right? That's, you know, that's just, <clears> right? It's still being very disturbing, but it's okay. not the same as saying, oh, it's so fragile that it's sitting on top of a mountain and you move in any direction, it's terrible. It's that there happens to exist a cliff somewhere. Right. Like, right, right. Somewhere there's a cliff you can fall off of. So, so this is not one pixel. This is on all of the <laughs> pixels. But anyway. The flip side is you can noise after training data and then more robust. Exactly. So you can, this is adversarial training or one form adversarial, adversarial training. You can just do essentially data augmentation with noise. But so adversarial attacks, so basically, can you deliberately make a network fail by finding certain small perturbations of the input? And how can you avoid that? How can you be robust to that? That's a very important research direction these days, uh, especially for security relevant uh, um, applications. So, so last thing I wanted to mention are rest nets. That's very important in order uh, to get deep, or is, is, a, is one strategy that can really be very, very helpful to train deep networks. Uh, so before rest nets, even if you did use rectified linear units, uh, so activation functions that do not have the gradient annihilation problem, um, uh, there would be a limit as to how deep you could train a network. Um, uh, so the, typically, you would have a situation that if you make the network deeper, even the training 
uh, error would increase. And this is just a result of not being successful at the optimization. This should not be uh, the case if you found the right parameters. Um, so an important step to uh, solve this problem were these ResNets uh, proposed in 2015. And as I said, the idea is essentially uh, the same that is already used in LSTMs. So you have an input, you have a nonlinear block that does some, let's say, convolution plus nonlinearities or a dense layer plus nonlinearities. And then you also have a path um, which just skips this, uh, these connections here. So this is also called skip connection. And then you just add the um, the two, uh, the outputs of the two. So you take the input and you learn essentially just a modification, an additive modification of the input uh, that um, goes through your nonlinearities. And so if you do this, then you always have this channel uh, which goes very deep uh, and it's just linear. So you can do nonlinear changes to it. So you do have to the, the, the freedom to learn very nonlinear functions, but yet you have a path that always carries meaningful gradient very, very deep. And that's one of the key tricks to, uh, to, to train deep networks. And then, okay, generative networks will be next. And yeah, I'm done for, for today. Thank you. Mm.